Good morning. Welcome to this Healthy Churches 2030 Conference Institute. And before this presentation begins, uh, here are a few things you should know. Uh, this institute is one of two concurrent sessions taking place at this time. Both sessions will be recorded. The session recordings, presentation slides, and any supporting material will be available on demand and posted to the virtual platform within 24 hours. All registered attendees will have access to the Healthy Churches conference platform and materials for one year. During this session, we are encouraging everyone to send your questions directly to the Q&A box. Uh, the chat feature is also used um, for more general messages and comments shared with your fellow attendees. And after this session, please take a moment to complete the feedback survey. And now we're turning this over to Bishop Dr. Horace Smith, who is uh, the senior pastor of the Apostolic Faith Church in Chicago. Bishop Smith. Well, thank you, uh, Carrie, and welcome to all uh, those around the world uh, who are involved with Healthy Churches 2030. We're delighted uh, to be your presenters today. Uh, for the next uh, 90 minutes, we're going to be sharing with you uh, from three presenters, myself, uh, Dr. Ray Van Key, along with Dr. Donna Baptiste, uh, and I hope that you'll be uh, challenged, but also informed and inspired uh, as we share with you uh, from this tremendous topic. And let me just go to my uh, board and, and pull up what I want to share with you today, and I hope you can receive it uh, in just a moment. So this presentation, uh, again, is to, and I see we have hundreds of faith leaders right on, uh, on target with us. Uh, the primary issue today in our presentation is about the church. And the question we're asking is, our church, our church is prepared for the next decade? And we're dealing with this from the lens of uh, justice and righteousness. Uh, and I want to share that with you as we move forward. Again, let me do it. Don't fail me now. All right. I guarantee we're going to get this right. So, so here's our, our premise and given to us by uh, our president, uh, Dr. Seal. Uh, COVID-19, sickness, race, gender, uh, equity, violence, all of these parameters and too many funerals, we believe have exposed either the effectiveness or the non-effectiveness of our churches and our ministries to connect in a positive way uh, to our communities. So today, this first uh, Leadership Institute will examine our theology, our organizational structures, uh, perhaps our biases, our culture, and especially our structure of leadership in our churches. We believe that some of these parameters have rendered uh, our ministries somewhat ineffective, uh, and we need them so desperately in these devastating uh, economic and health conditions. Uh, we'll also, at the end, try to provide with you, with interaction and answering your questions, uh, tools and models of leadership in areas that we believe will support and create and sustain strong ministries. And so bear with us with this very challenging uh, topic. We're going to use today a model, uh, and that model is going to be gender. We're going to look at women in the church as a demographic model to face the issues of being either effective or ineffective in ministry, and how those things impact uh, our overall community's health and wellness. I want you to know, please, to all leaders, uh, so you won't be defensive, I'm a pastor myself, that this is only a model, which means that the same observations we believe in lessons can be applied to almost any other marginalized group in the church or in our society in general. It can apply to the racial issues, to poverty, uh, to undereducation, uh, to mental illness, uh, all of these things we believe can be applied, but today we're going to use gender uh, as the model. So uh, the issue has to be the Church of Jesus Christ, and I will share with you a little bit about what I believe theologically should be the, the church today. As this pandemic hit uh, back in February and March of this year, I challenged my church that we as a ministry would be committed to thriving during this pandemic and not simply surviving. And so we have to have courage as faith leaders uh, that our role in society uh, is clearly identified if we use wisdom along with faith and we can deal with these pandemics. Again, I'm using a term that I want to identify with you. I think 
you're already aware of it. What do we mean by pandemics, plural? Well, we, we understand COVID a little bit, the biologic pandemic. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Uh, but also we believe uh, simultaneously with COVID, uh, we've been hit with the whole issue of systemic or structural injustice. In America, we focus on racial injustice, but this injustice, of course, is again, pandemic. Uh, it is literally around the world. Uh, I told my church I was overwhelmed a couple of months ago when thousands of people marched in the city of Glasgow, Scotland, and they were marching for Black Lives Matter. There are very few Black people in Scotland, certainly in Glasgow, they had thousands uh, marching, which means says to me that it's much more than a, an American issue of injustice. It's a worldwide issue. And certainly the church being global and worldwide has to ask itself, has it become relevant and effective in dealing with these matters wherever it may be situated? And, and so I, I wanna challenge you uh, to look at your ministry, our ministry um, through a different kind of lens than perhaps uh, that we've been uh, used to. I know in my church, we have done great things, I think, spiritually, but sometimes I understand that our spiritual lens has been affected by our background, uh, affected by, again, our culture, affected by our previous leaders. And so I want to just define uh, what I mean by the word lens. I think you're already aware of it. So a lens is a piece of transparent substance, usually glass, but it has two opposite surfaces but it's used as an optical device to change the convergence of light rays. It does that for two, th two reasons, magnification, making it bigger and hopefully clearer, but also a, a lens is used to correct defects in vision. I was at the ophthalmologist last week uh, and they did all kinds of testing, uh, all to make sure that what I see through my eyes is properly focused and it is magnified in a way that gives me clarity. So we wanna challenge all of us to use justice and righteousness, which I call truth, uh, as a lens for our ministry. So two questions, as a nation, how have we done in confronting and defeating these pandemics? Well, the, the first part, COVID, uh, unfortunately, we can be aware of. If you look at uh, the three top medical journals of the world, not the US of the world, look at nature, uh, you look at these scientific journals, uh, they came out a month ago, their editorial piece and it said this, in the US, we have, we have turned an epidemic into a tragedy. And that's a terrible thing. What they were alluding to is that because of the lack of a national view, a national plan, we have taken a pandemic or an epidemic and caused it to be a tragedy. Uh, in many models, if you look at the resources of the United States, along with uh, our economic, along with our scientific know-how, it was predicted we should have lost at the most 30 to 40,000 people to COVID. We lost, as of the day, over 245,000 Americans, and 11 million have been infected. Note this, in the last 14 days, over a million cases have been proven by testing to be COVID positive. So we've done a terrible job as a nation. And certainly we as African-Americans, especially and other marginalized groups, we know the story already that we again overrepresent both infection and death with COVID. And the issue again of injustice uh, is one that we are, are very well aware of, of uh, the numbers and statistics uh, are, are terrible. In Chicago, I remember when some of our chief officials in the first month of the pandemic said they were appalled and surprised by how many African-Americans, how many Hispanics were being infected and dying. And I, I wrote an editorial saying to them, why were you surprised? If the overall health conditions, the chronic situations in these communities are already marginalized, you should not have been su surprised that they took the brunt and continue to take the brunt of the hit uh, for this disease. And so as a nation, we have not done well. But this morning, we challenge you about the church. Has the, how has the church done in handling these co-pandemics? Uh, how have we done with COVID-19? Now have we done with, again, systemic uh, and structural injustice? And again, using as our model, uh, we have uh, carved out a gender, 
looking at our churches from that lens and saying, have we been just? Have we done righteously with a, a demographic that oftentimes feels very marginalized? We'll come back to this in a moment. So let me uh, take the license of using James Baldwin, one of my favorite writers, uh, and one of his quotes from years and years ago in Facing Difficult Truths. And James Baldwin said this. He said, not everything faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Whether it's the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's systemic racism, whether it's injustice on any level, I think that in order for us as a country, as a nation, as a world, uh, as a church, to change it, we must first face it transparently. Uh, if we're using uh, untruths or have truths, uh, misinformation as, as our foundation, then nothing's going to get better for the good. And so that's the challenge that we have. Again, going to the word of God, uh, it is very clear that truth, transparency, uh, which are parameters of justice and righteousness, are clearly delineated. Uh, in Proverbs uh, 4 and 7 says, uh, wisdom is the principal thing. It's the number one thing. Therefore, what? Get wisdom. And all you're getting, you must get understanding. Put that in context to the church, where our Lord says, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, the highest levels of evil, shall have no power to prevail against a prepared church, a church that utilizes wisdom, utilizes faith and understanding. And then again, in Hosea, we're all familiar where the prophet says that God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So again, we are positioned as the body of Christ globally. We have the resources from the Lord himself to deal with any pandemic uh, and any attack uh, that minimizes people. We've got to use wisdom to do that. So again, uh, looking at our ministries through the lens of biblical justice uh, and biblical righteousness. Now I want to look at two different parts of that. Number one, from the word of God, and then number two, to the church itself. And so looking at God's word, uh, the Bible, um, uh, in the Bible is often talked about this word righteousness or justice. And when I did my research in both the Old and New Testament, uh, the Hebrew and the Greek word is used for both. And they're seldom translated in a different way. So from the Bible, justice really is making things right that are unfair in society. And here's going to be our challenge. Can we look at our church with a lens of justice? Can we find out where there are discrepancies? And are we do we have the wisdom and the courage to make it right? And then righteousness really is the doing of it. It is doing right by my people, uh, and especially the vulnerable. Again, justice is more about the legal systemic problem, where is righteous is more about doing what it takes, usually acts of kindness, acts of generosity, uh, to rectify injustice. And so it means, again, to make it right. Uh, and as our God is loving and our God is calls us to be just as loving and to do justice uh, as well. And then from the church perspective, as you look into our churches, uh, I did some research about Dr. King, I found out that Dr. King's most quoted uh, biblical verse was Amos 5.24. And that is, let justice roll down as waters and let righteousness roll down as a mighty stream. What was Amos saying according to Dr. King? Dr. King quoted this. He said, as most of the Hebrew prophets were saying that what God wants is justice and right living rather than religious ceremonies for their own sake. You know, in my church, one of the popular saying is, let's have church. And, and, I, and I always say to them, let's not have church. Let's be church. Because if we simply do church, and if we ignore injustice, even in our ministries or in our society, then it is not too, it's too weak to say that God is disappointed. According to Amos 5 and 24, if you read the text, one translation says this, God says, I don't want your offerings. I can't stand the noise of your praise psalms or your organ preludes. If you don't want to do justice, then get out of my house. Sounds harsh, but it's not harsh. It is, it is God's heart to say that he is committed and his church must be committed to justice and righteousness. 
So to set this up, let me conclude in the next three minutes this way. Does the gospel that we preach and does the ministry that we generate effectively meet the needs and improve the health and wellness of those we minister to? I think that that's a credible question. Uh, and I've been in ministry for 45 years. Uh, and I have to look at my own uh, ministry and our ministry and say, is it effective to meet the needs? Does it improve? If you're part of my church and you follow the ministry that we create, you should be made better over the years because you are a part of it. Otherwise, we must question uh, the text, textual context and relevancy of our ministry. We've seen the, this slide over and over again in healthy churches because we understand that the real issue uh, to create effective ministry and health is not just personal issues, but they are the social determinants of health. In other words, the economic, the societal, and let me just say this, the spiritual conditions that influences not only individuals, but group differences and therefore cause health discrepancies. There are health promoting factors and there are health uh, negating factors such as distribution of wealth, of income, of influence, of power. And these are individual and uh, group behavioral risk factors that influence again, uh, vulnerability in our churches. The WHO says that this unequal distribution of health damaging experiences is not in any way or sense a natural phenomenon is a result of toxic combinations of poor social policies, unfair economic arrangements, where oftentimes the well-off get healthier and the richer get richer and the poor gets even more poor. It's bad politics. Same can be applied to our churches. So lastly, last but not least, I must ask myself the question, and I challenge you as we begin to ask some questions from this part of the presentation, does the gospel that we preach and does the ministry that we generate effectively target and improve the health status of the vulnerable populations that we minister to? Let me be totally transparent and stay in touch with, with my fellow bishops. Sometime in our bishop board meetings, uh, we, we, we are making rulings that support the high echelons of our ministry, the bishops and so forth. And I tell them that the higher you go, I believe the more responsible you should be. We should be trying to find out how do you help the people under us, not enhance those above us. Because if we do that, we are effectually causing injustice to perpetuate what we do. And again, we're gonna use women as our example today, but it could be the poor, the poorly educated, uh, it could be other marginalized groups, but all these I believe uh, are important. And so as we get to the end uh, of this, um, ministry presentation, we're gonna ask these questions. Uh, how, when it comes to biblical justice and righteousness, how would you rate your present ministry structure? How would you rate your leadership structure? How would you rate, again, the toxicity or non-toxicity uh, of your leadership culture? Are there demographics in our ministries that feel neglected or less than? And do we have effective tools to improve and empower them? And again, one of the examples I could, we could use as it comes to women, I'm gonna close with this. I had a meeting, a, a Zoom meeting with about 200 of my brother and my brothers in our church last week. And they said, Bishop, how would you look at uh, what's happening in this pandemic? And, and I cautioned them for our church. I said that I have become by my wife's estimation, uh, more radical in saying to people, you can't just say I'm not a racist. If you know the system is flawed, just being a passive non-racist is not enough or you perpetuate the system. You must aggressively and deliberately become an anti-racist. So if we're gonna use women as an example. If we think that women have been marginalized in our churches, then we can't just say I'm not against women. We must become for women. And I'm, I'm gonna close with that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna take about five minutes uh, to ask any questions in this segment and then we'll be coming back for our next presenter. Brother Kerry? And yes, if you have any questions, we're asking you to put them in the chat box um, or you can utilize the Q&A box and we'll be able to get all of your questions asked. And if there's not, I'll go to the next presenter.
I don't see any questions at this moment. We want to move forward to the next presenter. You can. All right, I'm going to do that. I'm going to share screen again. So uh, our next presenter almost needs no introduction. Uh, he has been a part uh, of Healthy Churches before and uh, we've had him come back because he's been uh, so effective. I'm gonna pull up his wonderful picture uh, as I introduce him. Uh, okay, there we go. So Dr. Rayvan uh, Key, the second uh, uh, pristine credentials uh, is an MBA in, in Psych D. Uh, he is the creator owner uh, of Empowerment Counseling. Uh, he does coaching, he does counseling, uh, he does tremendous things only in Philadelphia, uh, really, but around the country. And I mean this uh, sincerely. And so he's going to take our next segment and talk about righteous injustice and give us kind of an understanding of how we develop ministry, our thought processes, and so forth. Dr. Key, welcome to Healthy Churches 2030. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and good morning to everyone. And for my churchy, churchy people, praise the Lord to you. <laughs> I am so excited to be back with you all again. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, be at Healthy Churches uh, 2020 last year, and we are here at Healthy Churches 2030, and I'm so excited about what we are sharing this morning because I feel like it is important it is relevant and it is going to result in some wonderful uh, uh, action steps, I'm sure, once we are done. Um, I'm going to pull up my screen and share. Let's see if I can do this. All right. Can you guys see that? Hopefully that you can. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, as was stated before, uh, Dr. Smith has done uh, an awesome job at, at setting the premise of what we're talking about today. Hopefully you're feeling some tension. Hopefully you're feeling um, some urgency. Hopefully you're feeling um, your, your, your critical thinking brain uh, uh, working uh, because that's what we're hoping to be able to get you to do this morning. Um, I am a clinical psychologist. So a lot of the work that I do um, involves really understanding the psychological underpinnings of why we do what we do versus why and why we don't do what we don't do. And I want to use this opportunity to kind of uh, share with everyone what needs to be addressed from a psychological perspective, because if we're going to address this issue of justice as or righteousness as justice, we need to make sure that we have the psychological flexibility to be able to tackle these questions, to be able to uh, digest what's being said. And, you know, in the work that I do, working with leaders, working with organizations, I have found that there is not as much psychological flexibility regarding uh, one's uh, ability to kind of open themselves up to challenging questions. And what that results is in is a stagnation that keeps us uh, perpetuating things that are not good. So let's talk a little bit about the psychological underpinnings. So um, what I loved about Bishop Smith is that he talked about vision. He talked about lenses. And um, I'm, I'm not an optometrist, ophthalmologist, but what I do know is that when there is def defect in vision, you know, we have to question or not whether what we're seeing is accurate and true. You know, and, and when I think about the lens, I also think about um, uh, our theologies, our cultures, and what impacts or influences how we see and what we believe. And from a psychological perspective, we have to uh, uh, look at our family of origin dynamics, you know, because uh, for many of us, how we see, how we perceive is heavily influenced by that. We have to look at our church of origin dynamics and teachings. And we also have to take into consideration our personal experiences and traumas and the cultures in which we are embedded, the cultures that we create, the cultures that um, we subconsciously are a part of, but very much influence how we see and, 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 and furthermore, how we act. 
I have here that culture is deeply entrenched and hard to change once it is established. You know, when we're talking about culture, we're talking about a system of beliefs. We're talking about characteristics um, that bring a group together in a way that you almost don't have to say anything, but how people see and how they operate is based upon unspoken rules that are generally accepted. So we're going to uh, kind of highlight that and talk about that. As I stated before, culture development always deals with beliefs, systems, and people. And the questions that I want you to think about as leaders, as pastors, as those who are looking to make a change is, is what you believe true? And Dr. Smith, he talked about that. We have theologies um, uh, that we live by. We have methods of operation that we abide by. But my question to you is, uh, uh, do our processes, our systems, and our methods of operation support the impact we say we are meant to have? because we can, in theory, uh, communicate and share and articulate vision based upon what we think should be the impact, but be very inconsistent in terms of what we are doing. Um, and, 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 and that can look from the outside as hypocritical, that can look as inefficient, that can look as uh, uh, like we're don't, we don't know what we're doing. And we have to take those things into consideration if we as a church are going to be taken seriously seriously in the grand scheme of things. And, and, and the last thing is, are the right people in leadership or in position, and are they championing the culture of justice? You know, as an MBA, I've done a, little, a lot of research regarding leadership, and one of the things that they say is important in terms of facilitating change is that you have to find people that embody what you're wanting the culture to be. You have to find individuals that you can place in leadership who not only uh, uh, want to be in that position and have the capacity to be in that position in terms of ability, but they've got to get it. The question is, do they get it? Do they understand what it means to execute justice uh, as a reflection of righteousness? And if we cannot answer all of these questions in the affirmative, then my friend, we have a problemo. Okay, we have a problem. And Dr. Smith has mentioned that, that we can't tiptoe around this. We have to address this issue, all right? So culture change and establishment begin with leadership. And that's why we are sharing with you this morning because you know the, the development of culture is something that happens from the top down. Culture is embedded and entrenched down through tiers, um, T-I, uh, T-I-E-R-S, not T-E-A-R-S, even though there may be some tears shed by leadership in trying to facilitate culture, but it's, in, it's entrenched through tears, uh, and uh, leadership must explicitly communicate what they are wanting the culture to be. And, and we're going to talk a little bit further about how we begin to explicitly communicate that. But I find that many times we are tiptoeing around this idea of uh, 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 putting into action what we purport to be doing, you know. And as a result, we find ourselves really not helping individuals and also perpetuating a gospel that I don't feel is a complete gospel. Leadership must exemplify the desired culture and identify champions to help establish that. So we're back to that, the responsibility, the urgency, the mandate of leadership to number one, not only embody the culture um, that they're wanting to create, but also to find individuals whose personal missions all right, whose personal missions align with the mission of the church according to the scriptures. All right, and we have been already shared with uh, about the scriptures that it is our obligation to do justly, to do justice. One of the things that I have learned as a clinical psychologist uh, um, is to that my job is to, to focus on the human condition and the health and wellness of individuals. And I had the opportunity to do a training um, 
uh, uh, rotation in the Office of Disability Services. And in the Office of Disability Services, we have individuals who come in who for whatever reason, it may be a psychological reason, it may be uh, a cognitive reason, are not on an even playing field regarding um, their ability to perform and do well in college. So my job is to assess my job is to pick apart and analyze and find out the strengths and weaknesses and, and, and what uh, leads to a lack of inequity um, regarding this individual. And I have to uh, determine and suggest and recommend what we call accommodations so that this person can be put on an even playing field with everybody else in the, uh, in the community, in the college community. And you'll have individuals who are in, not in need of accommodations who will feel that it's not fair because the person was granted extra time. It's not fair because the person was granted uh, a distraction-free room. Uh, it's not fair because this person gets a reader during tests, you know. Um, but we have deemed that these accommodations, if given to this person, brings about equity, even though the others may not feel like it's fair. It's not about equality. It's about e equity. And that's what doing justice is, so that this person has the same likelihood and potential to be able to succeed. See. And our question to you today is, have we um, really questioned our vision to the point where we can decide, um, uh, hypothetically speaking, whether we are nearsighted or farsighted or having a stigmatism or something else going on our vision where we need corrective lenses? Huh? Um, and we need individuals to, to, to craft them for us so that we can have the right perspective. All right. So how sure are we about what we know? And I'll be ending soon um, because we do have an example using gender and women that are going, that's going to flesh this out even in a more specific way. But uh, the questions are, how consistent is what we say we are called to do uh, versus what we are, what is actually happening. All right. So think toxic theologies. All right. Uh, Bishop Smith brought up the idea of racism and genderism. All right. We're talking about not just being uh, 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 not against uh, a race or not against women or not against uh, 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 health care for all, but what are we doing to be for it? You know, we have to be uh, more aggressive and proactive rather than passive and neutral. And, and, and can we say that we are operating like uh, that example as a psychologist to look for ways to even the playing ground by being anti-racist and, 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 and anti-misogynist -misog uh, and things like that. Health disparity, physical and mental, what, we're do what are we doing about that? Economic uh, equity, how are we uh, working to bring that about? As a young black male, I am immediately considered a financial risk, whether I have an 850 credit score and a wonderful salary or not. When they look at me, they are going to uh, refer to their uh, original vision. And if they don't have the corrective lenses on, are going to see me through the backdrop of what they have been told and what they've been exposed to. All right. And we have to do something about that. Um, evening the playing field for systematic disadvantage. That's what I'm di discussing. And last but not least, are we preaching a complete gospel? The gospel is good news. And yes, the gospel is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, but but we preach the death and we preach the suffering and and, and we preach uh, being buried, but we, we we forget about preaching about the resurrection. And, and I don't know about you. I'm not just looking for heaven. I'm looking for the ability to walk in newness of life uh, as it pertains to all aspects of who I am, not just spiritually, 
but physically, financially, psychologically, economically, uh, 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 in terms of my health. And, and we as the church have a responsibility to ensure that happens. The Bible says that we need to occupy until he comes. So we need to be Jesus here now, being able to help people to live their best lives. I'm going to end with this. Um, I'm going to end with this uh, uh, quote uh, right now because I believe that I'm kind of over time and I don't want to extend it any further. Uh, well, well, then let me go back. I see Bishop shaking his head a little bit, a little bit. So just really quickly, I want you to think about this pastors, leaders, because I'm getting kind of riled up. I feel like preaching. <laughs> Um, but think of these, uh, think about these six things. Number one, identifying and admitting to the perpetuation of toxic theologies. Are we doing that? Are we in that position? Are we guilty of that? Number two, revisiting definitions of righteousness and justice. And Dr. Smith did a wonderful job helping us to understand that, that these two terms, um, uh, uh, et uh, etymolog etymologically speaking, are very much the same, all right? They are one in the same. They are interchangeable. And we need to revisit our definitions of that. It's not about shouting, dancing, wearing our skirts to the ground, and speaking in other, other tongues. We have to make sure that when we come out of the four walls that we are actually doing justice. I think we need to consider weaving justice into the fabric of Christian education. All right. We have wonderful books out there. We have um, uh, Sunday school material that we have used for years. But I think this is the point where we need to critically think about whether or not what we have predetermined uh, is important in terms of education, whether or not we need to incorporate some other things that gives us a more holistic view of what God is requiring of us. We need to move from defense to offense. All right, how anti-racist have you been? You know, are you just defending or are you uh, willing to, like the scripture says, our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, imaginations, barriers, psychological barriers, cultures that get in the way um, and that are dominated by principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to tackle the offshoots of injustice as reflected in health disparities within our community. And last but not least, ask yourself, are you confronting the proverbial knee on the neck of women within our reformations? And I'm gonna end there because I think it's a great segue into the example that we're gonna receive from Dr. Baptiste regarding whether or not we can say yes or no to that question. Thank you, guys. If you have any questions, please feel free to answer them. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, stop sharing. Yes, let me stop sharing. Great. So, Dr. Key, did you want to answer your questions now, or do you want to wait until the end? Let's take a few, a few, a few now, and then let's go to Donna after that. Okay. Um, one question is: What are some recommendations? to create more inclusive houses of faith and foster greater inclusion in the body of Christ as a whole? Well, when I think about, about that, the first thing that I, I feel that we need to do is be willing to have conversation. We have to have the conversation. Space needs to be made for us to be able to come together to the table so that we can actually know what's going on in the minds of people, in the hearts of people, in the spirits of people. Um, because I feel like we make the, 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 the assumption that those who come among us are like us. And that is absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. But we'll never know the diversity and the difference um, that is among us, excuse me, uh, uh, until we have conversations that allow people to share in uh, uh, confidential, uh, uh, judgment-free um, spaces wow. <laughs> in our congregation. And a lot of people won't share because we're so quick to judge. We're so unaware of what we're uncomfortable with that we shut people down before they open their mouths. So we have to be willing to have the conversation. 
Yeah, I think we, I want us to go to uh, Dr. Baptiste because I saw some of the questions that were saying, are you going to deal with the specific issues of, of the gender issues and justice righteousness? I think that her talk is going to help us to further look, I think, in specific to what we're talking about. Uh, and then we'll keep all these questions. We, we did this deliberately. We're going to leave at least 30 minutes at the end to, to answer all these questions. And so if you'll be patient, I want to say to all of you who are on uh, the chats and, and on the various platforms, some of you are asking, are you the only one? There's almost 450 people uh, in this session. And I'm so glad to see this. And I also appreciate the question, will we take these points and apply them? And I know that Dr. Seal uh, is committed to taking these points for the next 10 years and activating a plan to actually tear down the injustice that we're seeing and that we're able to admit to. So let me just shift and go to uh, Dr. Donna Baptiste. I do have a slide with her picture, but she looks better in person. Um, <laughs> I've known her for years. She is a master psychologist. She is a master leader. Uh, in one of the most uh, prestigious psychological institutions in the country from Northwestern and the Family Institute. Uh, she leads the counseling service. Uh, she is a woman of faith and of science. And I am just delighted uh, that she is gonna now give us some of the, the specifics of the gender demographic dealing with uh, practical applications of justice and injustice in the churches. Uh, Dr. Donna, uh, welcome. I'm glad that you are a part. Uh, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And this is my first time um, I'm in this forum, and I'm, I'm excited even about the talk that I know we sat down and prepared. So um, I come today with a very provocative question. And um, yes, and comments. Yes, okay. It relates to the extent to which the church is an ally in women's wellness. And I say this to you um, as somebody that I'm a God lover, gave my heart to Jesus at 16, never looked back. I'm a kingdom follower in the kingdom of God, highly educated, yes, but everything that has happened to me is because of the blessings and the mercy of God. My mom was a praying person and taught me how to love Jesus. And my question today is the church an ally for women. Many of you are leaders, you're probably um, very prominent in your congregations. And what I'm about to share, I think you know, the church matters to women. Women are more likely to be religious and believe in God, more likely to attend church, more likely to pray, do Bible studies, read scripture, and black women far more religious than black men, white men, <laughs> white women, Latino men and women. And in black churches, women outnumber men two to one. We, in some ways, are the worker bees of the church. Many of us are not the head of congregations, but we are the people that uh, lead, teach Sunday school. We lead Bible studies. We support uh, hospitality ministries. We visit the sick. We are the ones that uh, pray. Uh, we are prayer meetings. Um, we are the ones that do a little bit of counseling. And we women, are uh, likely more than men in some ways to be the ones that are in church almost in every service. Women love the church and the church in some ways is a place where hierarchies are broken down. There are women that are not highly educated. There are women that are highly educated. There are women from all walks of life. And this is a place where we can come and we can worship. So we live, love the church. And I'm one of them that have, I go to church almost every Sunday, not loving online church, but I am a church goer. And it is a place where I come to worship and meet with brothers and sisters and to find a sense of meaning every week. But here's my question. 
do all of black women's everyday oppressions really matter to the church? And I do so sensitively and gently knowing that I'm walking in territory that has not been settled. Um, this came home for me just a few days ago as I watched the election returns. Um, and there was a moment I had privately in my bedroom as I watched things on TV. And some women that are, that are listening today might remember this moment. Um, the race was called um, for Biden and Harris, the Biden-Harris ticket. And I remember seeing when they gave their acceptance speech, my eyes, the men in, in this situation, in this case, uh, Biden was ready to talk, but he was introduced by Kamala Harris. And I watched her walk to the pulpit um, or the, the lectern that she was speaking from. And I watched her there in her white clothing and tears began to flow from my eyes. It surprised me and something old in me started breathing. I remember I took a deep breath and I said to myself, talking to myself, finally, finally, it surprised me this moment of deep, a sense of almost reverence that something had changed. I thought I was the only one having this moment, but as I looked at my phone, text after text of other women that said, finally, finally. And one of the things that happened to me is one of the ceilings that I had seen as a young girl for so many years, just got not just a crack, but you could look up and you can see a little bit of sunlight. And I know I'm not the only one that felt that way. And it raises the question for you, do all of women's everyday oppressions, racism, sexism, classism, really matter to the church? All right. Women face old enemies every day. Racism, we know. Sexism, right next to racism. And for some women, racism, sexism, and classism affect us every single day. And the reason why I'm putting the three of them together is this, it's not one, it's compounded by the other and compounded by the other. And so every day, every day, and I'm saying to you, even as a woman, highly educated and in high leadership in a university that is prominent in the world, every day, microaggressions come from one, racism, sexism, and for some women, perhaps not me, I'm well paid, classism, and all three are enemies of women. They drive health disparities, which is why women are at the bottom of health ladders in some disease spectrums. They drive mental health conditions because women every day must deal with little slights, insults, invalidations, uh, micro assaults, um, the new face of racism, but sexism and for some women, classism right there. They're internalized by women. It affects how we see ourselves, our bodies. It affects how we understand our competencies. It, is, it affects how we, um, it gives us self-doubt. Um, even women, highly educated, women that navigate the world with a sense of power and influence. Every day, women face some of these things. They even affect how women see other women. Would they accept women in leadership? And I want to say to you, these three enemies intersecting, destructive, debilitating to women, and demonic. Here is a thought. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle, is what Audre Lorde said, because we do not live single. Donna, unmute yourself. Donna, I think you muted you muted yourself. There you go. Unmute. Carrie, can you unmute uh, Dr. Baptiste? Am I unmuted now? Now you're unmuted. Go ahead. Sorry. Yes. I didn't mute it, but probably, so what I'm saying is there is no such thing as single issue struggle. 
because we do not live single issue lives. That's what's said by Audre Lorde. And so here it is. Here is the space that many of us, many women live in. Here it is right here. Racism, but there it is, sexism, classism. And here we right here every day in some ways are the things that affect us. So what I thought I would do is pull out some of my therapy stories um, about ways in which the things that women have told me as, the, as, as we have a um, journey together in counseling, ways in which racism or sexism combined and classism in some cases affect women. Girlhood interrupted, the adultification of young women, sexism, and the fact that innocence is sometimes not afforded to them as women of, uh, as young girls of other races, traumas, small and large. If you are a woman that's poor and grew up in a home that was um, not always uh, resourced, likely to experience traumas, but other women have, and they're small and they're large, shifting. This is one you may not have heard the term of, where you take on postures to be what other people need. Inner turmoil, a sense of self down worries about the body, um, concerns about partnership, am I what I should be? Heart's desires unfulfilled. Many women looking to date, they want to marry, but 42% never will. Here are some other, the burden of being a strong Black woman. And by that I mean caring for a lot of people, mask of iron, taking things on, wearing self down, not rested betrayals in marriage and partnership, or if not betrayed, the fear of being betrayed, um, caregiving burdens, parenting anxieties, worried about children, illness, disease, and unwellness. These conditions are driven by racism, classism, sexism, all acting together. So what is my point about the question I ask? Here is my point, um, brothers and sisters. And I'm saying that because we are all believers and we love God and we love the church. But I wanna say to you, some of these oppressions exist in the church. Some of these oppressions are minimized by church leaders. We might wanna talk about racism, but are we talking about sexism? What about classism? Where the face of poverty is usually female. These oppression, oppressions constrain women's wellness. And, but I think today the idea is there is an opportunity to tackle this. And I wanna offer about four strategies, five strategies. Promote women's physical, mental, and emotional stamina so that they understand the intersecting problems of race, gender, and class oppression, not just one all three intersecting together, boomerang. Preach self-care. Preach physical care, emotional care. Preach self-understanding. Talk about rest. Talk about recovery. Help women to heal internally. Many doubts every day. Um, I, many women in my practice, professional women, women of all stripes, women who have never completed a college degree working their hearts off for their families. Same stories, doubts every day, racism, sexism, classism affecting them. Strengthen women's self-advocacy. Get women talking about some of the things that they face. Get women talking so they can be influential in your congregations. Get women talking so that they can figure out how can we support each other to live better, to live well. And this one matters to me a lot. The World Health Organization says this, and it, it's a big deal. The life course of girls, the life course of girls, girlhood affects womanhood. And I wanna suggest to you a place to really do this well, to start this story, to start the journey, support girls, girls of all ages, young girls, preteen girls, adolescent girls, because the quality of life of a girl affects the quality of life of womanhood. So these are my thoughts today, and I hope 
that it begins a conversation about how we tackle the three monsters that we face every day, racism combined with sexism. For some women, racism, sexism, and classism. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, thank you so much to each of our panelists for your, your words, your presentations today. And now we're gonna move into our Q&A portion. Um, if anyone has any questions for either one of our panelists, um, you can put that in the Q&A box um, and we'll make sure that those, make sure that those get responded to. Um, one question that we have um, that came through is whose responsibility is it to change church culture? Wow. <laughs> let, me, let me take the first hit at that because I think that Dr. Key alluded to it. And, and let me think back on what Dr. Donna said. You know, leaders change culture. You, you cannot look to the people who are under us to change it. It's, it's similar to the issue of racism. Those who are in power must be the advocates. So when Donna said uh, women to talk about it, I agree with that. However, men need to be allies with women to talk about it. It takes those who are not being oppressed, but who have power to change what's happening. And if, if they don't speak up, if they're silent, then it mutes what we do. So it is critical to know that uh, we have to, I hate to use this word, it's, sexy, it's sexism. We have to man up, we have to woman up. We have to take responsibility and not be defensive as leaders. And that's why we were glad when, when Pernessa allowed us to tackle this issue and to be transparent. We're not trying to hurt anyone or accuse, but if we cannot talk about it from the top, then not much is gonna be changed. And I have to absolutely agree with that. Um, I think I saw in the chat where someone had asked whether, like, what does a lay person do if leadership is not cooperative? And that is a question that a lot of people have. But, you know, many of us are aware that laity or, you know, those who are not in position and who don't have the power oftentimes find themselves running up against a brick wall. You know, because without that power, without that ability to influence, you know, anytime you use the word change, you're talking about influence. You're talking about rallying people around a goal and then drive, uh, uh, not driving, but leading them there uh, so that they can accomplish that goal. And that can only be done by leaders. So whose responsibility is it? The ones with the power. You want the position, you got the responsibility. There you go. <laughs> You're muted, Gary. Gary? Uh, I'm muted. Uh, sorry. A question um, directly to Dr. Baptiste. As a person from the Caribbean, and they're assuming from your accent, do you find there is a difference in the views of African Americans and other Black women in society and within the faith based sector? Um, thanks for recognizing my. I grew up in the Caribbean, spent my early years in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so say the question for me one last time. I just got excited with that mention. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find there is a difference in the views of African Americans and other Black women in society and within the faith-based sector? You know, I would say no. I would say no. Mm -hmm. And it might be the legacy of Black women in the diaspora. Um, in, most, in, in, in the Caribbean and in, say, Black American um, culture, churches, etc. Same issues that face women. Now, there are subtleties based on country and so on. In fact, but the same issues of um, uh, sexism, for sure, in that there are ceilings for women. Um, racism might have a different face in the Caribbean without the presence of, a, let's say, a majority white culture. Mm. But there are other forms of racism. Um, but I would say women deal with more than one thing at one time and that is true which is why in some ways the hierarchies we're at the bottom if not the bottom bottom we mm -hmm. we are we are somewhere there because black women you're not just black you're black you're female and the face of poverty um predominantly a black female i, I think we have to recognize also it may not be deliberate but the majority population sometimes have treated us in a way to have women of different backgrounds be against each other. 
one of, one of the most difficult things to deal with in the church is that if we're honest about it, the, the, the quality and equity for women is often hampered by women, but it's because they have been taught and raised in a way that they almost are against one another. Having said that, I agree with Dr. Batiste, I've traveled, traveled around the world. I'll tell you, in every society, women tend to be marginalized to some degree, but they also tend to rally around one another and come together. So those are my observations. And I would say in some countries, it's dramatically marginalized. Um, women may not own their own bodies, their consent to marriage. Um, there are so many, there are so many ways. And I would say, when I talk about it being internalized, there are women that actually, some women could be the enemy of other women in their bid for influence and leadership. I consider that one of the ways in which sexism is internalized. Mm. Wow. And it's why I'm recommending women that women get together and talk about these things. So. Thank you. Um, what's the best way to make women more inclusive without making men feel exclusive? <laughs> um, Whoa. <laughs> um, let me, let me, let me just say this. Let me say this. Um, it, 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 I, I'm old enough to, to have this view. And, and my wife charged me with this in the last few years. She said, you become more radical than ever, more militant. Let me say this. The fantasy of rectifying evil without making people in power feel badly is impossible. Impossible. Look, you want to have an omelet? You have to crack some eggs. I think we, we, we have to get past the how people feel who are in power. It, it's like many of our Caucasian friends, when you talk about racism, they are on the defensive. But again, you cannot change someone without them first coming to the same context of truth. So I don't think it's possible. I tell men in my church, if you are threatened by strong women, then you must be a weak man. If, if you who you are, why are you threatened by strong women? You, I would be uninterested in my marriage if my wife wasn't strong. So I think we have to conclude, you cannot uh, subjugate your effectiveness as change agents because of the feelings of those who may be threatened because human nature says, if I have something, I don't want to give it up. Power is not relinquished. It must almost be taken and what we hope to do is have a discussion together that allows us to move forward and realize, even though you must give something up, you're not losing, you're gaining by giving it up. I absolutely agree with that as well. Um, when, when that question was asked, I immediately thought about um, people bringing up the issue of how do we address systemic racism without making our ethnic or those who are privileged uncomfortable. <laughs> taking into consideration their feelings so that they're not, you know, dealing with maybe white fragility and all those types of things, trying to make sure that they don't crack as we're trying to, to establish equity. It is impossible, you know, and when we're talking about, um, you know, that question alone makes me know that there is an issue. The fact that that question was even asked that we would have to consider the egos of men and the fragility of their egos, you know, to try to uh, promote uh, inclusivity without messing with what they already got going. That and doesn't would, make sense to me. <laughs> I would say that in the book of Revelation, a little Bible for a second, there's this beautiful picture of um, all nations, all peoples, mm. worshiping God, the Father, book of Revelation, when we come into that new kingdom. And I think God was saying race doesn't, shouldn't matter. Gender should not matter. Book of Galatians, right? Male or female, it doesn't matter. But it matters here in a fallen world. And so it is something until we get to that place where it doesn't matter in heaven on that other side worshiping God, we keep fighting it. We keep fighting it. Men must be in the fight. Women must be in the fight. Mm. And that is my, and how we do that every day will be ongoing conversations. 
one must not be better than the other. Men have privilege in our churches and women do not as much. Um, so it's a conversation we must keep having. How do you cede privilege to women? How do women accept influence and privilege mm -hmm. in the church? Because in the kingdom of God, should not matter. Should not matter. Race or gender. Sex should not matter. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Bishop uh, alluded to the, the, the thought of strong women. Uh, one question came in, what is an objective definition of a strong black woman? Is there an undue pressure to be such? What does it look like and how is it cultivated? What are the mechanisms? How do men partner with women in this pursuit as well as develop a sensitivity to the same? I, I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Baptiste uh, blew this in a number of ways. And think about this, in, uh, in not to be self-serving. If I am seen by the majority as an example of what Black men can be, it almost takes them off the hook and puts more pressure on us who have quote unquote made it. But it's a scam because what you're doing, we have made black women super women, but understand when they are super women, they are not well. Uh, one, one example, about my 10th year of pastoring, uh, my church was is so kind to me. They had a pastor's day and, and our tech team created a, a cartoon of Superman and I was Superman, answering all questions, doing everything. And I, I said, wow, that's great. Then I realized, yeah, but now that's a false impression that you cannot sustain and it's not healthy. You can be, so I don't think we have to make them strong. We have to make them healthy. And that means it has to be balanced. Because if there's not, if you go too far, even in preaching or in whatever that's good, you corrupt it. There has to be balance with everybody's uh, Ephesians 4, that which every joint supply it, or one joint's going to break down. And I think we have to associate that healthiness with the idea of being strong. It's not being strong or being healthy. We need to reframe and redefine and say healthiness is strength. Oh. Um, strong black woman is not that black women are strong, They're no ifs and buts, oh, but the, wow. strong, the strong black woman is a way of seeing the world in which almost automatically we're giving care, selflessness, self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, living that out without examining it have kept women, have expended women's lives. Yeah, and yeah. in good studies, it has shown to be connected to health issues, living this out without examining, without rest, without boundaries. It has been shown to expand women's life related to both health conditions and mental health conditions. So you can be strong, but strength must be balanced with rest, rejuvenation, recovery. We need sabbaticals in the church. We need furloughs and uh, women themselves must be partners um, in their own self-care but this wow. must also be preached and supported by leaders in our churches. Can you uh, expound a little bit on the whole notion of self-care? What does self-care mean? I guess I can start with uh, Dr. Key. Um, what does self-care mean um, from, a, from, from your perspective and how can people of faith um, achieve mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a great level of self-care? Mm -hmm. Well, when I think of self-care, I think of one's um, ability to be in right relationship with themselves, their ability to model and how they treat themselves, how people ought to treat them. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of times people are looking for approval, they're looking for acceptance, they're looking for value. And what it does is it causes them to violate their own boundaries, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm have core values about what they believe regarding themselves, but oftentimes they're not consistent with their own core values because they are trying to make everybody else happy. Mm -hmm. And I think self-care are the activities and the ways of thinking that allow you to be in a healthy relationship with yourself uh, and that it, it is demonstrated outwardly to the point where people know how to treat you and mm -hmm. respect you. Yes. You know, I would say... Go ahead. Go, ahead. Go ahead. I was going to well, say self-care 
it, it may seem contradictory. Self-care should not have to come from self. We need to institutionalize what self-care is so that it gives permission to all of us to be healthy. I understand the advocacy of the self, but if I must advocate for myself, it means that my society does mm -hmm. not have health in itself because right. I have to I have to demand it from myself. It would be better if we, like healthy churches, other institutions, would institutionalize the parameters of healthcare, and then the self can perhaps nuance it for them. Right. But overall, it has to be a value that we all hold dear. And that allows us to be healthy on a broad scale. Mm -hmm. um, Self-care has many parts for women. Um, neuroscience is showing the connection between mind, body, and spirit. Breath, so how we breathe. Um, mm. There are wonderful um, adventures in spiritual, in um, religious, Christian-based meditation. It's all about breath. I would say there, it's also connected to sleep. It's connected to social connections. It's connected to a pace in which we work, emotional care, therapy can help, um, uh, recreation. Um, there's a beautiful sense of awe. And so this is where we turn to nature. All of that is self-care. Mm. All of that is self-care. And uh, there are times when the idea of self-care might be even shamed in the church, too mm. much about self because of our understanding of self must die. But the Bible is so many beautiful examples of self-care all through the Psalms, all through the scripture yeah. of self-care. Um, and it's simple. You don't have to do all of it. You can do some of it and it brings, it returns wellness. Right. Real quick um, question. Do you think that Paul's teaching that women should be quiet in church somehow perpetuates marginalization against women in the church today? We're gonna let Bishop take that one. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. I knew you were gonna say that. Thanks so oh, yeah. much. You're my, you're my <laughs> true <the> friend. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't. I don't want to come off as a super progressive liberal, but e even going to the issue of the the beginning of this talk on truth, you know, thank God for our forebears that taught us what we know, but let's not blame them mm -hmm. for perpetuating what they did not know. We must grow in our knowledge. And so even Paul's, some of Paul's statements are cultural to be applied in the cultural context of that day. So if the sons and daughters of Issachar understood the T-I-M-E-S, that means that the application of truth and the understanding of truth changes, not truth itself. So if there was a culture where Paul was dealing with a certain segment being overbearing, or of another uh, spiritual background that made them unwell, that was appropriate for that moment. But if in my church, if women keep silent, we in serious trouble Be because we've got to have the whole. Uh, there's a book called, you some of you have read it, Half the Sky. If we believe that God has placed talent, ability, uh, specialties in all of us, and we marginalize half of the people, mm -hmm. we're going to always be hamstruck. So we've got to get over this issue of uh, quoting scripture out of context. I know there's a danger that we can almost justify anything, but in this in this case, we see what well, even the, the, the church of Jerusalem was a Judaistic church. The church in, in Antioch was multicultural. The church then going on to Ephesus was even more cosmopolitan. And you saw that the application of scripture changes as we evolve as the body of Christ. So to hanker back to that, I think, is not tenable. And we must stand and say, here's the truth as we understand it. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be in deep trouble. You know, uh, when it, it perpetuates the issue that men are smarter than women. I'm going I'm to close with one that may be kind of inflammatory. People, people quote the scripture, it says that uh, Eve was deceived and Adam wasn't. So we can't trust Eve. Let me ask you this theologically. Let me agree with that and say this to you. If Adam wasn't deceived and still opposed God, he's worse than Eve because <laughs> he knew what he was doing. He wasn't deceived and yet 
he adamantly opposed God. So we got to get over this blaming one another and understand that the wholeness of the body of Christ is all of us working together. And I would say the fight is for the next generation of women, not mm -hmm. us. We are older, we're middle-aged, heading into the third phase of life. Mm -hmm. Younger women um, are not loving being members of churches because wow. in the world sphere, they're leaders, they're encouraged to be influential. It feels at odds to them. And so we have the secularization of, of uh, practice and many, uh, they, they would think of themselves as loving God, not so much the church. And that's the next fight for the decade wow. to bring our younger women and modeling for girls back to church. And in these spaces, they must also see themselves as influential. We cannot silence them. Wow. I, I think also that we need to be careful of trying to run things like our forefathers ran them. The people that we see, the churches that we lead are not our father's churches. No more. When I think about Abraham, God said to Abram, I want to make you a blessing, but I need you to get up, get out of your country, away from your kindred, out of your father's house, and then go. I'm not even telling you where you're going, but you need to leave. And I believe that that has to do with um, not only the physical distance, but also the way that his father's house taught and the culture of his kindred. And if we're not careful, we will try we will try to run things according to how our forefathers thought and believed and won't be um, critical thinkers enough to realize that that I'm dealing, God is trying to bring me to something new and he needs me to kind of unlearn some things in order to get the job done. So we have to take that into consideration as well. We've got to move away, you know, and we've got to be willing to unlearn some things and realize I'm not, this is not my daddy's church. Great. Um, one more question before we wrap it up. Um, are there any books uh, that you would recommend for reading? So many, so, so many books. Uh, somebody was just quoting in the chat box, I think, uh, the, the, the book, uh, uh, Cass, what, who wrote that? Uh, Wilkerson. C Wilkerson? My wife is giving me some instruction on here. Isabel. Yeah, Isabel Wilkerson on Cass. Um, is a great book that puts in perspective what Dr. Baptiste talked about, gender, sexism, classism, that are unwritten laws and rules in our churches, in our society. Um, th there are so many that talk about that. Uh, Half the Sky is, I forget the author, is another one, very powerful. Uh, we've got to educate ourselves and to demand our leadership to be re-educated. I'll use this as an example. I'm a physician, I'm required, I got my, my degree in 1975, but to practice medicine, I must keep current. That means I must have a hundred hours of CME credit every year. If I can't do that, they stop my license. I think that we have given sometimes the ministry a pass. We must have leaders that keep up, that read. And I'm th thank you for that question. And, and I'm, I'll be glad to send in a bibliography of what I have that we need to begin to read about all these issues. Even the issue of racism, there's some books today that are so powerful that even black leaders need to read so that we can educate ourselves, that we can talk to the others with these conversations. And without it, I think we're gonna be hamstruck again because we're not current. Dr. Key, Dr. Baptiste. Um, I, I think a book that comes to mind for me now, this um, is not, you know, a book of theology. This is not a book about racism uh, and, and all of those things. But I alluded to, um, you know, I talked about culture and I talked about processes and systems. And I tend to read a lot of books regarding leadership and business. Um, and there's a book by a man uh, named Gina Wickman, who has a book titled Traction. Mm traction. 
If you get this book, I promise you it will change your life because it talks about culture. It talks about processes and systems. It talks about having the right person in the right seat. And I think that if churches can learn that, you know, it's not about just being able to preach well, getting people to shout and, 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 and uh, dance, but you want to gain traction in what you're trying to do. And that there are books out there that provide strategy to be able to do that you know so if you read that book it'll give you that strategy and it'll help you even release yourself from some of the guilt around disappointing people i tell people all the time that leaders have to learn how to disappoint people at a rate that people can handle disappointment is inevitable but this book help, helps you to, to, to do it in a way that's strategic um, that is valid and you won't feel so guilty about uh making some people upset and people leaving the church. <laughs> we'll get a list of books that make sure we give to the to the bomb that we all recommend. Uh, Glaude, some of you know him. Uh, he's written a book on democracy in black. Uh, there's a couple of white evangelicals whose books I think are cutting edge. Uh, Jennifer Harvey talks about dear white Christians and reconciliation. And I'll, I'll send those in. These are powerful books that bring us up to date with all these areas that we all are concerned about. I mentioned one in the chat, um, and there are self-guided questions, a great book for Bible study written for women in the church. It's called Too Heavy a Yoke, Black mm. Women and the Burden of Strength. Um, and uh, Shaniqua Barnes Walker, excellent book, 2016. Great book for Bible study. By a awesome. woman that was in pastoral care. She herself is a minister. Awesome. We will definitely make sure that we get those um, a listing of the books that you recommend, and we'll make sure that that is uh, attached with this particular session um, that will be uploaded to the on-demand session. So we want to thank each and every person for the time today. Um, our panelists, any final words and thoughts before we close out this session? Raven? Um, I had a wonderful time. This, this conversation has ignited a fire in me. And I'm just so glad that I was able to be a part and to share my um, knowledge and my understanding and, and be an encouragement to so many great leaders. I pray that 2021 is a year to remember, not in, in terms of the bad, but in terms of the execution um, of righteousness as justice for everyone. <laughs> Go ahead, Donna. Um, even before Kamala Harris um, was the, uh, the, became the vice president elect, I've said, if you look around the country, there is a great energy building in black women. The next decade will be a decade of black women's leadership and influence, I think in a way uh, that is unprecedented, starting first with an understanding of self and the issues and the demons that we tackle every day. But I think it's going to be good. And so I am excited. Mm. I'm looking forward to it. Look out for it. Sisters, if you're here, the decade of the Black woman is coming. Wait for it. It's no, it's not, it's not coming. It's here. It, it it's is here. here. It is here. And it's not, because, it's not because we just elected one. It's because women, uh, and I think it actually, it's a spiritual move of God. Let's wait for it and seize this day. And seize this day. I would close by saying this, um, and all those comments are so powerful. Uh, I have I have learned and am learning one thing through these two pandemics. I, I don't believe God sent the pandemics, but I believe the Lord is using them for a message. We must remember our common humanity. We must stop defending our specific gender, politics, background. We had we need to be humble enough to hear each other in dissonance and listen and learn, and then together move forward. Because if we do it individually or because of our, I'm a black man or a black woman or whatever, we're gonna lose, we're gonna win a, a battle and lose the war. The war has to be won by God demanding that his creation work together. And so I, I, I really appreciate um, th this encounter and I hope uh, that we can move forward with some action points from this session and others that will revolutionize how we think about one another and how we treat each other. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to all who uh, attended this session today.